fellow alums from the Leland program. Um, we've done some, we've done a webinar about just sort of the program logistics and um, how the program works from the standpoint of staff here at the, at the Hunger Center with the Leland program. Um, but now is a chance to talk to people who have actually been through the program um, or are currently in the program. So I am Emily Byers. I am Senior Director of the McGee Leland International Hunger Fellows Program. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our International Program and Operations Associate, Leila Amarir, to take us through today's panel. But it's great to see all of you. Thanks for joining us and thanks for your interest in the Leland Program. Leila. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Leila Emerier. Like Emily mentioned, I work on the Leland team. And today we have a panel of really amazing Leland alum and a current fellow. We have Brian, Pat, Brian Pride, Faye Duan, Grace Heimsfield, and Rachel Gilbert. And we're going to talk a little bit today about their experience, background, what they've been up to, and then have some time towards the end, around 20 minutes for any questions and answers. You're also welcome to put some questions in the chat box and then we'll get to it at the period of the question and answer. So to kick off, I would like for our panels, panelists to talk about their self, what fellow class they're in or we're in, a little bit about your background and why the Leland Fellowship. And we will start off with Brian. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Pride, as Layla said. I'm actually in the current uh, Leland class, which is the 10th class. Um, prior to taking on the fellowship, I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana, um, and I worked as an agriculture extension volunteer. I ended up extending my service on a USAID project, and then I ended up working for USAID for two additional years while I was in Ghana. And um, I had a lot of experience in terms of what it looks like from being a field officer, what does it look like for being an extension officer and having that type of experience from agriculture. And with a prior to joining Peace Corps, I had received my master's in public policy focusing on sustainable development in agriculture. And so I wanted to try to figure out how to bridge that gap between all of my field and technical experience and a policy uh, technical experience. So I decided to take this fellowship because it was an opportunity for me to have all this experience from being in the field and then also gradually get that experience of directly having more policy influence and policy work environment. And um, so I'm currently, or yeah, so my, my fellowship is, has been a combination of that field experience and, and this policy desire. And that was one of the main reasons as to why I decided to do the Mickey Leland Fellowship. And do you wanna talk about your host organizations? Yeah, sorry. So um, my host organization started out as uh, Rise Against Hunger, which is an organization that primarily focuses on uh, food aid for areas that have experienced some type of natural disasters, violent conflicts, or just extreme levels of food insecurity. Um, and so for the first year, I did a lot of work in terms of supporting them on how to figure out how to develop programs and implement those programs. Um, due to COVID, uh, there was some shifts that were actually made with my fellowship and how I was able to carry out the second year of my fellowship, which would, would have been the field placement year. Um, and so because of those changes that we didn't know would happen due to COVID, we have actually changed my location for my fellowship. And now I'm working with interaction and um, I do a lot of work, or I'm doing a lot of work that's specifically related around policy and how to bring in that field experience into that into the policy arena. And to Capitol Hill. And we'll go to Faye. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Faye Duan, and I am a graduated fellow from the ninth class. Right, that, that's the right number. Um, the the past class. Um, and so I went into 
the fellowship with um, a Bachelor of Science in Sociology and Environmental Studies. So actually two Bachelors of Science, um, but I also had worked for three years before joining the fellowship um, post undergraduate. And so um, right before I joined the Leland Fellowship, I worked for a mediation and facilitation firm called the Meridian Institute. And so I worked with a lot of mediators and facilitators on a whole variety of projects um, having to do with public policy issues in international development and, um, and environment and natural resources and agriculture and all that. And so um, my placement was with Oxfam. I spent my first year in Washington, DC with Oxfam America doing mostly primarily policy advocacy around US foreign aid um, in food security. And then I spent the second year in Senegal doing a variety of research that supports Oxfam's various campaigns on climate change, on um, the West African dairy sector, and on um, agroforestry uh, in Mali. And is, is there anything else I've forgotten? Yeah, talk a little bit why, why the Leland Fellowship. Ah, uh, yes, that's right, thank you. Um, so I was really, really interested in the Leland Fellowship because um, I just, uh, in the three years after I finished my undergraduate, I just saw so much the value of people that understand the policy aspect and being able to connect that to whatever work they're doing. Um, and so I just was immediately attracted to that connection of um, being able to develop myself into a professional that is fluent in policy as well as whatever work in the field, whether it's research or programs or any of that. And I also knew that I was really interested in um, international work. And so I saw that many of the positions that past Leland Fellows had were ones that were really exciting for me. And so I wanted to take the experience I had with the Meridian Institute further by getting um, on the Leland Fellowship. Great, thank you for that. And Grace, let's hear a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Grace Hinesfield. Um, I'm a registered dietitian and prior to the fellowship, I was finishing up my graduate degree at the University of Michigan and getting, and getting my RD license. Um, and I applied for the Leland Fellowship because I'd done some work in uh, development before. Um, I'd worked in Haiti on a nutrition project and was school feeding program. So I really was interested in getting my foot in the door in the humanitarian nutrition space. So using more of my clinical skills that I was uh, gaining in graduate school. Um, and the humanitarian sector is really hard to get your foot in, into the door in. Um, and I also applied to the Leland Fellowship because the cohort aspect was really attractive to me, especially coming out of graduate school where I was part of a really close um, graduate class. And I knew like easing into the workplace that that was something that would um, be, be really attractive. Um, so during the fellowship, I was placed with Action Against Hunger. I spent the first year with South, in South Sudan supporting um, nutrition program management for various clinics from a field, field base. And then in the second year, I was at headquarters in New York um, working on a specific research study that was a simplified protocol for treating children with malnutrition. Um, but in the course of that year, ended up getting roped into some pretty cool nutrition assessment projects, which is how I landed my current work, which is as a consultant with Action Against Hunger UK uh, with their nutrition surveys that they implement uh, globally. Anything else, Ayla? Yeah, I believe you covered all the questions. Um, and now, Rachel, bring us home. 
Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Gilbert. I am also a member of the ninth class, so I'm a recent alum, and I was placed with the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, I actually just recently left IFPRI a month ago to start a new job, so I'm now um, continuing that work, but I'll, I'll first talk about my transition into Leland. For a little, um, basically, I had studied abroad in undergrad. I was an environmental studies major. I had an amazing study abroad experience. Um, I was in Cameroon. I felt like I learned a lot. I returned to Cameroon after I graduated from undergrad to do a volunteer experience, which was less fulfilling than I would have hoped. I think I felt a little bit disillusioned with myself and with the idea of international development after um, having sort of failed a little bit along the way. Um, and I ended up working on a research or as a research assistant on a book about world hunger. So this was a very interesting topic to me, the link between agriculture and food and food systems. Um, and in that situation, I, I realized that I wanted to be in the research world. So um, basically, I went back to get my master's right before the Leland Fellowship. I completed my master's at Tufts University at the Friedman School. Um, so I did my master's degree in agriculture, food, and environment. And during that experience, a very policy-focused program, I think I became very interested in, as sort of other people have said, linking policy with fieldwork. I had some fieldwork experience. I had these narratives in my mind about what international development is like. And then I think bringing it to the policy realm is a very interesting shift. Um, there's a very different approach to policy than there is to working in the field. You have to have certain narratives. So I wanted to deepen my experience and have a, a more thoughtful experience going back abroad. And I think the Leland Fellowship was perfect for that particularly because of the cohort, but also because of the built-in discussion around how to do international development in a way that is positive and thoughtful. And um, the Leland Fellowship was really attractive to me for that reason. And um, during my time at IFPRI, I was first in Malawi. So I spent my first year as a, I was doing some communications and some research. I started off mostly doing communications work um, helping with a high level event. And then I transitioned into a research project, um, which I worked on actually with people from Tufts. So I got to sort of design my own research project. Um, and then in my second year, I was in the DC headquarters and I continued work on those research projects. And then I added some new ones, um, which I continued on after I finished the Leland program. I just kept working on all of these projects um, again through, with IFPRI and that's where I'm at now. Did I forget anything? Yeah, no, you hit everything that needed to be said. Um, thank you all for sharing. I wanna dig deep into your fellow experience. So a little bit more at, like about some of the projects you worked on. Was it humanitarian? Was it um, agriculture? Talk a little bit about that and just kind of your overall experience um, at your actual placements. And we'll start off with, uh, with Brian again. All right. Um, <clears throat> so when I was working with uh, Rise Against Hunger, I mentioned that I really focused on programmatic design and programmatic implementation. And what it was a really unique experience because I had been living abroad for about four and a half years um, before I started the fellowship. And then I've also lived abroad several times before that. And um, coming in with a very strong technical background, one of the things that's been very interesting for me just working in the field of international development, specifically with food security, is that you are not always dealing with a lot of technical people. You don't have a lot of people with um, agriculture experience. And so a lot of the work that I was doing was working with our partners in the various countries that we work in and looking at what were their objectives, what were the things that um, they wanted to work on. And then I worked, I assisted on uh, securing funding for those projects and then also assisting with what those projects looked like and how they were implemented. Um, and so in addition to that, I also started to create learning series or opportunities for our 
partners because we work in about I was overseeing about uh, five different projects in five different countries and so it was an opportunity for us to start actually um, having our on the ground partners come together exchange ideas talk about the various um, challenges they were experiencing with food insecurity and that was a unique opportunity because all of those partners were in Africa and shockingly enough it is actually um, not common to be able to get other African countries to be able to communicate with one another and exchange ideas from an international development perspective. And this was really a shift for me because I wanted to um, strongly encourage locally led development initiatives. And so lucky, luckily enough with Rise Against Hunger, um, because they were also new in actually developing uh, program implementation, they were very interested in looking at ways that they could also develop locally led leadership. And um, I think that this like speaks volumes to one, just what the Mickey Leland Fellowship offers. It's an opportunity for you to come in with your experience and to be able to talk about your experience and exchange ideas with partners and other organizations that have been working in this industry. And, um, so it's like there's that one element of what the fellowship allows for you to do, but then the second element is the fact that like because there is such a rigorous process also for host organizations to go through, there is a certain level of where those organizations also have to be interested in creating change and challenging the current systemic system that we operate in. And so uh, Rise Against Hunger was also very open to having these types of conversations and dialogues. And I thought that this was a really amazing opportunity for this fellowship experience, because a lot of the times when you're a fellow or you're an intern somewhere, it's kind of like you're just given a lot of work and then just told to do that work. But um, this fellowship was different because the type of name that the fellowship has for itself organizations are like yes we know the type of people that are coming from this fellowship we can trust them we can give them significant workloads and so um that was one of the first things that i started doing one of the other uh one of the an, an additional successful project that i was working on is we actually started to totally transform how we were implementing projects due to covid so it was been a very interesting experience of having this fellowship throughout COVID-19 because you're set up with a work plan going in, you know exactly how your two years of the fellowship are gonna look like, or at least the shell of it. And then there's some type of changing and adjustment that's gonna happen while you're in it because that flexibility is extremely important for working in international development. But then on top of that, we have had a whole new set of challenges and a whole new set of things that we've had to learn how to adapt and alter and change and be flexible within. And so um, what we've actually been able to do is uh, we started an entire campaign of virtual training videos. And this is something that because of this involvement that I've been working on um, with Rise Against Hunger and because of the fellowship, it is also created these other opportunities where I was invited to speak at a few different um, webinars and events to also talk about how we were being at, um, adaptive to the types of programs that we were doing. And um, so I think that, you know, the main takeaway thing for me about understanding how this fellowship operates is the fact that, you know, if you're coming in with this fellowship and you, have ideas and you're willing to talk about those ideas and you're willing to be adapted and you're willing to, to really look at what needs to change in order to help us move towards and actually achieve the millennial goals and to, to, to achieve uh, food security, then this is a great fellowship for that because the whole point of this fellowship is to be able to have those open discussions and those open dialogues about the type of change that needs to take place and where we currently are in international development. And um, I've just been very thankful for this opportunity uh, because especially coming from a background of working at USAID, there were a lot of times where I felt like I was fighting against the system that was supposed to be serving communities. And sometimes that bureaucracy really makes you feel paralyzed of working in this field because there's so many things that are going on simultaneously that need to be addressed. 
And um, so coming from that experience of where it was very stringent, very regulated to now this fellowship where I'm working with not only my host organization, but other partner organizations that are also trying to be dynamic and are also trying to be adaptive to the times. Um, it was, it's been a really great opportunity to just kind of work in such a drastically different environment than what I had come from previously. That was great, Brian. <laughs> um, so Faye, Grace, Rachel, um, I guess in that order <laughs> to answer that question. If you recall all the questions, it was a long one. Sure. So um, let me just start chronologically. So in my first year in the policy placement in my fellowship, and I want to note that um, my fellowship was a little different in that we normally, the rest of the ninth class cohort, they started in their field policy, um, their field placement before doing the policy placement. But um, in my situation, I did a policy placement in Washington, D.C. before I started the second year in the field. And so in that um, placement with Oxfam America, I was. Um, yeah, I was in a, a great situation. So my boss, he's um, he's the agriculture policy advisor at Oxfam America. And um, basically there was this piece of work um, which was doing advocacy um, quite particularly on the Global Food Security Act and getting that reauthorized that uh, he was um, he had, you know, followed through in the year before, and he wanted to continue to do that advocacy the the following year. But he didn't quite have enough bandwidth to um, to do that all himself. Um, it involved going to a lot of meetings in coalitions with other uh, nonprofits like Action Against Hunger and Catholic Civil Services and uh, all of the, the big players in the food security nonprofit field to um, get together, work in coalition, kind of track what's happening with Congress and what, where what's happening with the bill and then strategize together and say, like, how do we target these people and these people in Congress and pull our resources so that um, they pay attention to these issues and um, they will make sure that we reauthorize the Global Food Security Act. And so um, I had a really great mentor in that he knew all of this. And it first, uh, more and more, he was able to hand off this work to me to go to these meetings and then go to the Hill and talk to Congress people um, so that I was able to take on that work more and more as the year went by. Um, and so it was reauthorized, um, the Global Food Security Act. A lot of times when you work in advocacy and policy, um, you it's not that easy to see um, a policy win, in, especially if you work on something within the length of a year. And then um, I did work on a few other things um, aside from that, but that was my main thing. I, I had also a kind of a particular situation in that I was, um, I had meant to go to Mali and work on a project there with Oxfam in Mali, but um, at last, oh no, can you still hear me? Nod if people can still yes, hear Yes, we you. can still hear you. Okay, great. Yes. Um, my, my headphones lost power. Anyways, um, so the second year, uh, my placement in Oxfam and Mali was canceled at the last minute because there's obviously a lot of security um, concerns in Mali. And at the time they decided, actually, this is not a good idea to send you there. And so I ended up in Oxfam Circle, 
which was really, really great. So um, I went there with not a huge idea of what is what is in there for me. Um, but then I got there and just started talking to people. The country director sent out um, emails to basically everyone there and said, I have this person and here are her skills and um, do you need any help with anything? So I, um, and obviously people are really, really uh, eager to have help. So I ended up really getting involved in research um, because there is no research department in Oxfam Senegal to, to do a lot of the research backstopping things to support their, um, their projects. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I did some research for their climate adaptation work because they were um, at the time working on their West Africa climate strategy. And then I also worked on this really, really cool campaign that's um, multi-country and in collaboration with Oxfam in Europe on the West African dairy sector. Um, and then um, what became my biggest project was a project called Regreening Africa in Mali. And so I ended up doing a lot of research on the policy component of that project. So. Oxfam is implementing this program uh, in a consortium with other nonprofits in Mali, and they have a component which is we need to do policy advocacy to make sure that our program activities, which is agroforestry, really, really succeeds and um, we can identify and eliminate the policy barriers to that. So um, that became my big project. And I actually, after the end of my fellowship, stayed on as a consultant with them for um, a while to complete that work. And so, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's the short of it, but I can take any clarifying questions in the, a later part of this webinar. Am I next, Layla? All right. Uh, so kind of like Brian mentioned um, earlier about Leland's reputation, I feel like I've really benefited from that with Action Against Hunger as well, where um, because Leland was a really trusted fellowship program and had a great reputation, I was kind of absorbed into the organogram, uh, into meaningful work that they both needed and matched the skills that I had pretty quickly. So in South Sudan, I was assigned to a field base and um, I, I forgot to mention, I was part of the same class as Rachel and Faye. Um, and in South Sudan, there was another fellow there as well. We were just at different field bases. Um, so she and I were working on similar projects at our respective field bases. Um, we were responsible for coordinating a feedback mechanism for programming. So um, from clients who were attending our, our clinics to Action Against Hunger, what feedback mechanisms did we have in place and how did those really need to be adapted to the context um, in terms of what was perhaps keeping folks away from being able to access our treatment services um, regularly. Um, but in addition to that, I really just wore whatever hat that the base needed. So um, I supported different program parts of the program management cycle, um, a lot of donor reports, a lot of uh, supporting staff that were engaged in regular data collection. Um, if the water sanitation and hygiene program manager was out, like maybe I would help that stop that work. Um, I really just got to plug into to various uh, needs of the base while, while still being responsible for this feedback mechanism project. Um, which was really what I wanted from the experience. I wanted uh, various experiences and I also like wanted to be able to uh, be useful. Um, and then in the second year, I was assigned to a, a research project that was a, a bit unique in that it was uh, the, the principal investigator was with the International Rescue Committee. The Action Against Hunger was playing a supportive role. So in that year, I got to 
be part of the coordination team between those two organizations um, with research uptake for this study that was proposing changes to uh, the supply chain for the, the food that's used to treat children with acute malnutrition, um, which is a, a really charged space. There's a lot of policy implications in, involving WFP and UNICEF with any proposed changes for, for the pipeline of product. Um, so not only did I feel like I was engaged in like really meaningful big research questions, I also got to see two different very large organizations perspectives on that issue. Um, I had a really phenomenal supervisor at Action Against Hunger who about halfway through keeping in mind the things that I'd really enjoyed during the first year. There was a project that came up in Haiti that um, wasn't related to this research project specifically, but they needed somebody to go for two months and she worked that into the work plan for me. Um, and it's, it's really how I got my current role. So um, that's just to say that I think in both years, um, I felt like my organization had a great understanding of who I was and where I was coming from, from the fellowship in terms of what skills I had to offer, but remained like really flexible to what I wanted to do in the fellowship. Um, and in the second year, I, I also got to um, be involved with some event planning and um, some like larger research dissemination work, which was just something I hadn't had exposure to before. So I feel like I really got to tap into the various experiences in both years. All right. Um, so I think I touched on some of this in my first section, not realizing that I was going to tell you more. But um, basically, my first year in Malawi, I when I first arrived, um, my role, I think that my specific role was called a communications and research assistant. Um, and I spent the first two months mostly helping with a big high level event. Um, so mostly doing comms work and like event organizing. And I also was helping a lot with editing of working papers and other outputs for IFPRI. Um, I feel like this was sort of testing the waters to see like what I could handle, what I could do, but I was really excited about the research component of it. And um, in line with what Grace was saying, I think my placement did have a good idea of my skill set and they also put a lot of trust in me to come up with my own research project there was like a broad outline of what they wanted me to address and there was also one specific research project that they had they basically had a paper that had been really popular in Malawi um, with previous data sets and they wanted me to update that um, and in addition do sort of like my own research spin off of that. Um, and what ended up happening was that my professor from Tufts actually had leftover money from a different grant and he wanted to do a research project in Malawi. So he contacted me and asked me if I wanted to basically be involved, oversee it, do the analysis, et cetera. And shockingly they said everyone was like yeah sure go for it so I got to work on this project which was such a wonderful experience I think it it gave me I had originally plan, been planning to just use previously collected data um, because there was no budget for me to collect my own data um, so it was really really exciting to get to do more field work um, I worked on a project basically looking at quality and uh, caregivers interest in using pre pre-made like commercial infant cereals so basically like a porridge that maybe some of us ate it, like cream of wheat or something like that um, a fortified product so we were looking at the quality of that and it was very exciting to do the field work, collect the data, disseminate and analyze the data, disseminate the data. That was just like a huge added value for me. Um, and the office was very flexible and me basically going, not rogue, but like going off on my own and doing this with, <laughs> I wasn't rogue, but um, sort of outside of their purview. So that was great. Um, and as I said, I also worked on some other analysis of data they already had. So that was my first year. Um, basically, I was mostly doing research after the first few months, and I always had a couple of communications activities that I helped with, just um, as most people in the office did. And then in my second year, I continued a lot of that work on Malawi, um, spent a lot of time on that. But then I had 
I still think this is so funny. I was asked one day, there's a Papua New Guinea program that started right around the time that I, um, I got to IFRI like a year before or so, two years before. And they had this one like small research need. They needed me to estimate some way to like adjust the prices in, in the estimates that they had already made. So they asked me to just like generate a, a spatial price index, which I was like, oh, maybe I can just do that. They're like, it'll probably take you a couple of days. I spent like my entire year <laughs> doing that. It was very cool. It was a great project. And um, actually just today, I got my first academic article published, which is from that work, which is super exciting. Um, Obviously, I worked on it also for the year after <laughs> when I was hired to work at IFPRI. Um, so basically, I started a bunch of research projects in my first year in the field, continued them through my second year, added new projects. And then when I stayed on with IFPRI, I just, I've just been continuing all of those different research projects. Um, and in my second year, I think I also went to Papua New Guinea. Uh, yes, the years sort of blurred. Um, I was also able to travel to Papua New Guinea to help with research dissemination and a little bit of prep for data collection. So that's basically what I did. Nice, thank you everyone. So a few things that people have mentioned, Brian and Faye, you know, the sheer nature of global development work can sometimes be unpredictable and plans can change. So just kind of got to run with things. Grace talking a lot about like the cohort and kind of how it really helped her blend into like the working force. And then Rachel talking about a lot of the ownership of research that she was able to do. So I think for time's sake, I want everyone to kind of touch on what was their biggest takeaway from the fellowship, maybe a skill that they really gained during their time that they didn't necessarily expect. Yeah, um, I think actually very similar to what um, Grace and Rachel were saying is that I also had a lot of opportunities where I wasn't necessarily expecting it, but it just kind of happened. Um, and so for like example, um, like I was able to, I have have written like several um, short papers based off of some of the work that I've been doing now. And those papers have been accepted for conferences and I've presented at two conferences so far and I have another one coming up in January. And that wasn't really something that I was expecting or that I thought that I wanted to do when I was applying for this fellowship. Um, but it was an opportunity that presented itself. And so I just decided just I didn't do it. And it's been pretty cool. And it's been a different perspective um, or a different avenue of talking about international development than I really thought about um, wanting to do before. And um, one of the things that I'll say that I wasn't really expecting is that I, because of the, like, you have an interview with your host organization or your potential host organization before you're, you're actually placed. And so it's an opportunity for you to kind of ask questions, but you're, I know that for at least me, I also felt like it was such a rigorous process to even get to that point where I was just kind of like, I just want to do it. Like, just like, I'll work with like whoever's going to be there. Um, but what ended up happening is, is like I went through that interview and in like the first couple of weeks that I was on the job, uh, Rise Against Future was like, you have like all of this experience from all these different things. And they started asking me to work on projects that weren't originally in my scope of work. And because of that, they sent me within the first like two months of my, or the first like three months of my placement, um, they sent me to South Sudan and Malawi to, to actually do like um, a field assessment of the projects that were going on and a potential project that we were gonna start. And um, so I think like what I'd say about this is that this fellowship is like, you know, whatever you're willing to put in and the hard work that you're trying, that you invest you're going to get that return, but you have to put in that effort and you have to be able to like say that you're flexible, that you're willing to have these different approaches and take on these different perspectives and try different things. And um, when you approach it with that flexibility and when you approach it with that mindset of like, I'm just going to put in what I can, you're going to see a lot of positive returns on this. And you're going to be offered a lot of opportunities that you didn't think that you'd be offered. And um, 
I think like this is something that's actually been said a lot from other fellows in my cohort, but when you're putting like, because of the, the knownness of this fellowship and the respect that, or like the expectation that is of you as a fellow, you're going to get that type of workload. Like they will give you project management status. They will give you projects that are solely yours, you know, or at least that's been the experience for a lot of people. And so it's like, you know, I think that it's a long process and it's kind of rigorous, but if you're willing to put in that work and you're willing to be open-ended and be flexible and like have that open dialogue on the different approaches of ways that things can be changed, then I think this is a really fruitful opportunity for you. And I think that a lot of opportunities can come from this that you weren't even necessarily expecting. And I'm really thankful for that. And I'm like really thankful of the fact that I had people encouraging me to even apply for these conferences and write these papers because those were things that I wouldn't have done before. And it's actually been a really interesting aspect of my fellowship that I wasn't expecting. This is a really great question that you asked, Lila. Um, and, and yeah, I do also echo Brian that um, being open to learning experiences that you have not expected is, is a really good quality to have if you're a Leland Fellow and you'll benefit a lot from it. So for me, I'll talk about two things. Um, the first one is kind of the experience of doing a major policy research project and authoring a report. Um, that was something that I did not anticipate doing. Um, and I like never imagined that I would one day have um, basically a, like an 80 page policy research report published on Oxfam's website. Um, and so it all started out kind of like a small research question like, oh, we want to just, we want you to just do a little bit of research about kind of identifying the policy barriers to agroforestry here and um, not very, a lot of guidelines and not a lot of ideas about, um, oh, like, this is what we want it to be like, or this is what we want you to do. And so I started on that research project and it just kind of snowballed to where Oh, okay, so this was what I found. And now here's these other things that would be interesting to know. And so then it turned into a larger research project where um, they were sending me to Mali to interview like small um, smallholder farmers from like all these different regions of Mali and like basically shipping them into Bamako to talk to me and then talking to like all these other experts. And then um, it just, the research project got bigger and it got a lot more fleshed out. Um, and in the end, I had a 80 page report with rec policy recommendations that um, they will use to do their advocacy work for this program. And I um, even hosted a we workshop webinar for Oxfam in Mali and their partners who are working on agroforestry in Mali um, to talk about these different policy barriers. Um, so that was, uh, that was a little mind blowing for me that I would one day end up in this, um, in that spot. Um, and so the other thing that I didn't really anticipate, but I really, really appreciated is that uh, I got to work for Oxfam, which is really, really strong on their policy advocacy work. They do a lot of really cool campaigns. Um, and what I learned is that, well, first of all, I learned exactly what that is and what that entails and also how it's essential and important it is to, um, to international development work, to like any kind of work. And having that skill set and that understanding is, is really, really great uh, because sometimes I talk to program people and they're like, oh, okay, so we have this policy component on our, on our grant or our program about um, like policy advocacy or something like that. And they just like, don't really even understand what exactly is advocacy? Like, what is that? You know? um, so, I think it'll be a really, really good 
added value to have um, for future employments and for a lot of different roles that you could have. Okay, so in addition to what Faye and Brian have already said, um, I'll, I'll add two that come to mind. Uh, I think I was surprised at how mutually beneficial the field to policy placements felt um, for myself and the host organization. Um, because if, if you think of it, um, and maybe this varies by organization, but like one year in another office that's part of the same organization is quite a bit of experience. Um, and when I came to the policy placement at headquarters, we didn't really, we didn't have any staff in the office that had spent uh, one year in a field office, let alone South Sudan. So, um, and, and you know, they, they got the double benefit of having myself and Sarah, uh, my co-fellow who had had those experiences in different field bases for a year. So it, felt very mutually beneficial, both myself learning what um, maybe some of the, the reasoning or explanations or the, a different perspective for what I had seen when I was at my field base, um, but also just to be able to speak into a, a little bit of my experience from um, at, at the headquarters or, you know, put them in touch with somebody that could speak to it much better than I could. Um, the second thing that surprised me about the fellowship or that I felt like I really benefited from, um, which I wasn't expecting was just to curate like so much of my own uh, management philosophy in the two years. Um, in the humanitarian space, it starts to feel like a, a merry-go-round. Um, you know, Sarah and I got to South Sudan and of staff from non-South Sudanese origin, there were probably 30 of us. And by the time we left, we were the sixth most senior um, in terms of time in South Sudan. So that's just to say there's a lot of in and out. And I saw so many management philosophies and styles and myself had several managers in that year. And then to come to headquarters and have uh, not only a manager at Action Against Hunger, but also a manager at the International Rescue Committee. And when I applied it, I don't think I had that explicitly in mind, but especially with what I do now, which is um, managing teams on, on short term surveys. Um, I think I really learned a lot from di different styles, both in what I would like to, to uh, duplicate and maybe some things that are just not how I will do things per se, not to say that they're wrong, but that they just wouldn't work for me. So I think that that was just such a huge value add from those two years, especially being in this position of a fellow where your hands are kind of in different honey jars, so to say, of different projects. Um, it's something that I look back on and think was really unique to the fellowship that I might not have gotten if I was yeah, in, in a workplace without the fellowship. Okay, I think the thing that I wanna focus on for this question is, uh, the cohort and my experience with my cohort, because I think even though I was really excited about the idea of a cohort, I think kind of like Grace said, I, I've always had a really positive experience with having a close group of people around me in grad school and in college and just sort of people to bounce ideas off of. And I was excited about that. But given that you don't actually get to spend that much time with your cohort, I think I wasn't expecting the level of like learning and connection that I felt with my other fellows. Um, and it was just so wonderful and surprisingly change, like, like mindset changing to surround myself with people who were constantly challenging me to think about the things that I'm, I was doing. And I think it's very common and I certainly felt like I'm doing useful work because I'm a good person and this is good work and everyone in international development, you, it's very easy to like lose site of questioning and looking at things in a critical way and the cohort and our experiences with our different um like mid-year meetups and even just our discussions sort of informally have been so useful and i i want to say that that's true after the fellowship so grace and i talk every once in a while about work and things that we're doing and we talk about management styles sometimes we talk about um a whole bunch of other things and i just i found professionally and personally my cohort to be a huge part of my life during the fellowship and even after um and i think that's a really 
I was expecting to have a, a connection, but I wasn't expecting to do so much like digging into what I was doing um, and questioning it and making sure I'm surrounding myself with people who try and make me be my best self. I think that was definitely what I found with the cohort. Um, and it's also the thing I tell everybody that I talk to about the Leland Fellowship that I think is the, like one of the biggest added values of the, of the whole experience. Um, and I think the other thing I want to touch on is I was so nervous going into my Leland Fellowship. I, Emily, I don't know if you remember, but I was so worried that I wouldn't be capable of the level of work that people were expecting of me. A lot of people have touched on this feeling of um, being given a lot of responsibility. And I think having a, a good reputation for the Leland Fellowship, people know that good people come into the fellowship. And so they expect you to do that. And they expect you to do that because you can do it. I was so nervous. And I, we did realize also that pretty much everyone in our cohort came in with a little bit of imposter syndrome. And I think we, uh, most of us realized like you can do it. And there's a really wonderful balance between coming out of imposter syndrome and maintaining humility um, and realizing like, even when you're doing your work, there's a lot to reflect on. So I think all of that came from discussions with the cohort and I um, was pleasantly surprised by how um, those experiences really made the fellowship wonderful for me. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. So as we see, it is already 2.53. There is always a lot to talk about when you're talking about two years of your life and like Rachel touched on like mindset changing experiences that you have. And then it just kind of, you know, there's always a lot to talk about. I'm sure each individual person can just go on and on and on about it. So I do wanna leave some time for questions. We are at 2.53, we have this set for an hour. If it's okay with everyone, I think at least maybe five minutes going over given that um, the panel discussion <laughs> went a little bit longer than expected. But if there are any questions that people have on the call, feel free to come, to come off mute or you can put something in the chat box and that will be read out loud. Uh, I have a question. Um, is that okay? Um, I can chime in. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing incredible stories and your experiences all over the world. I have a question regarding the COVID thing. So, I know that most um, any kind of U.S. state funded, um, you know, programs and in, in terms of any kind of pandemic, uh, were, did you face any crisis where you had to be called home from your um, host country and then you had to come back home and then you had the challenge of finishing your project long distance and and if there was so, how did you navigate? Because this was so extreme, 2020 was so extreme. So I just wanted to know if there's any current fellows in that in that space. I know this is the 2019 cohort, but maybe the 2020 cohort experienced that. Brian, Brian had to race to a plane. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I was actually in South Sudan and had to be like evacuated within 24 hours um, because the borders were closing. But I think what I can say is that I actually felt very supported by um, Congressional Hunger Center because I was in a place that didn't have electricity or Wi-Fi and um, just like the responsiveness of both Emily and Layla to help support me in that situation um, was like just astounding. Um, and so, and then I'll even say just like the amount of communication that was even leading up to that because we had all, we were actually all supposed to meet in Kenya for a cohort retreat. Um, just their timeliness of being like, okay, this is what's going on. This is what the policy is. This is the stance that we're taking. And the fact that there were there's 14 of us but every email that we got from congressional hunger center was this is the stance that we're taking but each of you are at a different location with a different host organization with a different country and different levels of preparedness and so the i felt there was a really good balance of saying like generally this is the approach that we're going to take but each individual person has a unique circumstance and please feel comfortable with bringing that forward and we will work with you on that individual level and it's just like you don't see that 
in every organization that you work with. And so it's like, even now as we're like still navigating this with as much as everything is changing, um, Congressional Hunger Center has been really great at adapting and making sure that they're still supporting all of the fellows and that our, our fellowship is still as enriching as it was supposed to be, even though that we have all of these restraints. So did you have to come back to your host, I mean, uh, from leave your host country and come back to US to finish your work? Yeah, that's what okay. we ended up doing for me. Okay. And some of our fellows, they came back um, and some of them stayed the entire time and some of them have come back and gone back to their, okay. uh, to their post. So it's been different for all 14 of us. Okay, and one last question I don't want to take up. I want to make sure other people have time. That what would you define as um, one of your most challenges? You're in some hardship post like Sudan and elsewhere where there is security issues and so forth. Um, how did you guys prepare yourself uh, for these very unknown extreme circumstances? Um, for South Sudan, uh, like Congressional Hunger Center has like their own policies on safety and security for fellows and each host organization also has to submit a safety and security report and like plans of action. Um, and so it's like there is a there's constant communication going between Congressional Hunger Center and your posts about what expectations are and how you can be supported so it's not like you're just going to get dropped off in the middle of nowhere and somebody from like a Peace Corps background, like that's exactly what happened to you. Um, and so like, this has been a lot more hands-on than what I'm actually used to. So I think it's been great. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your feedback. Yeah, I think to follow up from that question, um, there are two questions in the chat box, but since it's kind of is segueing into this question about, so a question was asked for you, Grace, could you talk about what it was like living in South Sudan? Um, and kind of the security situations and how you were able to adapt to that and kind of your experience to that. Yeah, sure. So uh, similarly to what Brian mentioned um, and, and just how Action Against Hunger approached me being on the team, um, I, I was part, I was treated under the same security teams that other staff members were. So there was an entire uh, security support network and constant communication about um, any any restrictions that I had. But frankly speaking, I don't think my life looked too much different in terms of what I enjoyed doing. Um, I was still able to, I don't think Leland would have sent me anywhere where I was completely cut off from communication. Um, so I had pretty frequent check-ins with Emily and family members and friends and enjoyed a lot of the same things that I enjoyed doing here, like reading and going for runs and things like that. So um, yeah, it was all under the discretion of the security uh, managers that were on staff. Great, thank you for that, Grace. And another question in the chat is about professional development funds, PDF. How do you all use that during your fellowship? I just answered in the chat, but I'll quickly say this is also my favorite question for everyone. So I feel like it's my duty to now answer it. Um, and I, so my first year, I went from Malawi to Ghana for this really great week long conference. It's like a, it's called Agriculture, Nutrition and Health. So uh, Academy Week. So I did a couple of days of learning labs and then a, um, a couple of days of a research conference. Um, and I went with two other fellows. So that was a really great experience. And then in my second year, I used some of my funds to return to Malawi for basically like a research dissemination trip, which, um, was outside of the scope of my original work, but like a, a very, I felt a very important um, trip in terms of developing certain skills. Uh, and then I also used it for some coursework. So I took some courses in the Stata data analysis software. And other people used it for conferences and other things, but other people feel free. Grace, you did a smart survey training, right? Yeah, I did training and then in the second year I took French lessons. 
Also, Emily, I just wanted to touch on, I know this isn't specific to a, a hardship um, post, but we did have a really wonderful orientation, like a week of orientation um, before we left. And I think we talked about a lot of strategies for being successful in the fellowship, which, I mean, I think people should be thinking about before, as they're applying anyway, but um, we did talk through a lot of those things like self-care strategies and how you can use your cohort to support Um the different transitions. And so just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, I think that's, that's huge. I mean, you're in South Sudan, but there was another fellow in South Sudan, but also there were several other humanitarian fellows that we just set up regular check-ins with. Um, and then as a fellowship, we were chatting pretty frequently, whether it be book club or we set up on um, just individual sessions to, to check in with people. So I felt like really in strong communication with folks. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll just bundle it into one. Um, a kind of more practical. First of all, um, going off of the French and Wolof lessons, I was wondering what kind of language you came into the program with and if you had an opportunity to um, use that language or if there were some type of language barriers that you had to overcome. Um, and secondly, um, what was your work-life balance like? I can start. Yeah. Um, I was placed in Malawi, which is um, in terms of like work, English speaking. Um, I took Chichewa lessons while I was there, which I never needed. It was useful for some aspects of my work, but I actually didn't really need to do that. Um, and then, so, um, sorry, what's the next question? There was oh um, any language barriers you had to overcome and the work-life balance. Oh, work-life balance. Um, in my first year, I think my work-life balance was really great. I um, There were like periods where I had a lot of work for the uh, getting the study up and running where it worked really long hours. But it, for the most part, I had a, I think I followed a very um, normal, like nine to five, like nine to six type of schedule with a normal break. Um, and, you know, we had time to take trips like a few normal vacations, basically. It was as if I was working a nine to five job, basically. Um, and then in my second year, I did end up working a lot, mostly just because I had a lot of projects and I felt um, that I wanted to deliver on them or like some projects that were my actual work and others that I felt more um, personally tied to. So once I started working on Papua New Guinea, I also really wanted to work on the Malawi stuff. So I did end up working a lot more, but I think it would have been uh, very appropriate for me to have had like a normal nine to five, nine to six type of schedule. So quite good from my end. Okay, I can add my experience too. So I, um, so for my placement in Senegal, I came in with some, uh, some French. So I did a year of study abroad in France and during my undergraduate, although I hadn't used it for three, actually four or five years, but um, but it, it all came back to me. Um, and so my placement really, really helped me get a huge amount of improvement with my French skills um, because I had to do a lot of research and even writing that was in French and all of my coworkers, they spoke French. So, um, so that was also a really good opportunity for me to, to really get good at this language. Um, and um, in terms of Wolof, that's what I use my PDF fund for. Um, that's something that I wish I could have improved more on, but I was already focusing on French at the time that um, it was just really hard to do both at the same time. But I was in a majority Senegalese office um, so there were, are very few non-Senegalese staff in my office and they all spoke in Wolof um, like all, all the time. So it would have been really helpful, um, but uh, 
I got to learn some and um, I'm still advancing. And in terms of work-life balance, um, I think for me, the experience was I had a pretty good, I had a pretty good work-life balance. Um, I would say that it also depends on the office culture that influenced my work-life balance. So um, in my in my first placement in Washington, DC, there's definitely more of a culture of you know, people staying at the office later. Um, whereas in Senegal, that was very less of um, a thing that you would see colleagues do. And so I was really encouraged to just get out really quick as well. Um, but otherwise, I, I didn't find myself consecutively staying at the office really, really late for like long periods of days and weeks. No. Um, okay, so we are seven minutes over. Um, a lot of really great questions. I there are two more coming in. Oh, just thinking. I think one question that we did miss someone asked about like the diversity in academic background, um, if it's just MPH or agriculture or some, I don't know where the exact question is, but I Sorry, guess- Sorry, I just responded, which made that confusing, okay. I think. Perfect, it's, it's great. Thank you so much. It's sometimes hard to like keep up with the chat. Well, if that is it, if we have any more burning questions, any more last call, Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, you guys gave some really great just insight to your personal experience and then just the overall experience as a Leland Fellow. As I mentioned in the chat and the confirmation email, we will have this uploaded onto our YouTube, I would say by Monday, the latest. So just in, if you want to come back and look at it before you submit your application, that is due January 11th. Um, you will have this as well as the information session on our YouTube channel. And the application guide, which is on our website. Yes. Thank you so much, Faye, Grace, Rachel, and Brian. It's always wonderful to see your faces. And to have Thank you. you. Yeah. Great to see you too. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>